Welcome to my first Gintama video! I'm sorry, I'm so excited. First of many, I hope, because there's a lot to say. And in case you've not seen Gintama, good news! Because I will be analyzing the humor. I will not be spoiling any of the plot elements, and I will not be spoiling most of the jokes. I'll only be using six or seven jokes from the series as examples to amplify my points. So if you have not yet seen Gintama, you're lucky, because you will soon be watching it for the first time. Now, this is my first comedy analysis, so it may not be as brushed up and pristine as the psychological or philosophical analyses on anime characters that I'm used to doing. But, you know, I hope I improve because, well, there's five types of humor in Gintama and they're blended together brilliantly. Today, I will be dissecting one of those five categories being Gintama's brilliance in the art of parody. How when it parodies other anime, it does such in a way unlike most other parodyists, if that's a word. So many people haven't watched Gintama even though they've seen clips here and there. So I apologize if this is not one of the videos you were waiting for. I did do a poll on Twitter and this one somehow managed to beat Zerif, World Trigger and stuff. So I guess I'll be working on those right after this one with my Aizen analysis on the back burner because that one's taking forever. In any case, let's begin analyzing the brilliant parody prowess of Gintama with pretty much the first analytical Gintama video on all of YouTube. First of many, I hope. God, this is an unappreciated gem. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of parody. Now, there are several ways Gintama goes about parody altogether, but one important thing I'd like to keep in mind throughout is that the humor derived from Gintama's parodies is never to insult what is being parodied. This is extremely important because there's another level of respect in all of Gintama's parodies that it has for the original material it's making fun of. For example, Gintama was trying to think of a way to become more popular, so they decided to come up with a completely original idea and how they were going to go about it. Totally not based off anything. Where they would use attacks like Bankai, Gamu Gamu no Pistol, and Kamehameha's fighting against opponents that look eerily similar to Crocodile and Cell and whatever. They're going to call this original adventure of theirs Dragon Bleepies. A totally original idea. <laughs> It's hilarious because there's the meta aspect involved in them wanting to increase their own sales. It's hilarious that they're trying to pass it off as an original idea, but again, it's giving credence and praise to the anime that's being parodied. And it's like that with almost all of its parodies. Furthermore, it props them up in a different fashion because it almost always uses this parody strategy as almost self-deprecating humor. They're saying, we suck, we can improve by being the totally original idea that is Dragon Blee Peace using Bankai's and Devil Fruit. They ask, why is Gintoki's hair all wavy? Well, that's because he ate the wavy, wavy no me on his journey to become king of the pirates. And where they're trying to explain his story, oh, he'll be an amazing king of the pirates. Look at this scene here where he beats Piccolo. <laughs> or in a Dragon Ball Z parody, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, who would have thought in the background, having absolutely nothing to do with anything, Aw, oh, Grillin dies. They'll need to get the slippery balls to save him. And then, of course, that parody takes a whole turn trying to amass the seven slippery balls to save Grillin, who's always dying. Completely losing themselves and immersing themselves into this ridiculous fantasy they came up with. It's based on a self-deprecating, respectful humor, and I love it. That's the backbone to a ton of Gintama parodies, and it's important to have in mind because all the humor that spouts from Gintama and trust me, there's a lot of it, and I love most of it. All stems from Gintama itself. The other anime are used to make Gintama funnier, as opposed to Gintama being funny because it's insulting other anime. So with that said, let's discuss the various aspects of parody under this umbrella of how Gintama treats whatever is being parodied. Now, all the examples I've
have given our base form Gintama parody, where their meta humor places them in situations outside of the confines of Gintama's plot. Now, I consider this base humor because they're not necessarily integral to the story, they're just goddamn hilarious and there has to be more of them than there are. I would watch a whole season of Dragon Blee Peace. God damn it, why did Family Guy get Star Wars movies and Gintama doesn't have a whole 200 episodes of Dragon Blee Peace? That would be amazing. Anyway, back on topic. Until now, we've covered how the parodied anime are treated and Gintama's extraordinarily enjoyable way of leaving the confines of its own narrative to give us a good chuckle. Now, what if these parodies are within the narrative itself? Well, there are generally three types in that respect, too. Do you realize I'm breaking down the parody humor in Gintama, which is one of five types of Gintama humor, and I'm breaking that down into three categories of parody humor, and the second category of parody humor that I'm about to mention has three parts to it! Gintama's so damn good! Even its comedy breaks the fourth wall, and not by directly breaking the fourth wall, but it's like every joke made in Gintama is like watching all of Inception, and then it turns out they're in the matrix so the three types of interplot parody and note that's different than a reference a reference is a completely different type of humor and it's way more dialogue based and a different one of those five categories but as far as parody goes the first type i would like to bring as an example is a jojo reference <laughs> gintama referencing jojos is the best so they're investigating this creepy old place and there's this lady and there's an evil spirit coming out of the lady. Now, I personally would be scared out of my underpanties, but fearless hardened warriors like Gintoki carefully analyzes the situation and he's like, I don't think that it's an evil spirit possessing her. I think it's her stand! And to continue the parody, he goes into full Jojo pose with a Jojo art style. Now, I call this more parody than even reference because Gintama always takes these jokes to the next level. Me personally, I would think that's hilarious. Moving on, let's see what this spirit can do. But then, Gintama dwells on the point that, wait a second, the dynamics of the JoJo universe must apply since this is a stand. So, the only people that could see stands are stand users. So Gintoki comes to the conclusion that he must have a dormant stand as well. It's a completely evolved level of parody that also really makes you love Gintoki so much more because you're seeing exactly where his mind is. He genuinely believes the joke he's making. To us, it's a joke. To him, it's his mind logically trying to understand what's going on. Ah, must be a stand! That's the first type of parody interwoven into the narrative itself, where it's Gin's psychology itself that introduces the foreign element and he actually believes it exists. The second type of interplot parody is the complete opposite and it's so damn good! I believe it's the first episode or two of Gintama 2015 and I don't really want to ruin that little arc because the whole little mini arc was actually hilarious. But the point is they got this special magic clock that somehow is stopping time and they're trying to get Gengai, the ultimate mechanic dude that could freaking do anything to fix it. So now every time they stop time, they find out a different way that Gengai died. So then with this magic clock, they rewind time again. And it's another stupider way that Gengai keeps dying in a different thing that they're somehow altering. The butterfly effect is killing off Gengai every single time until they realize, no, we're not taking any more chances. They go to a remote desert where absolutely nothing can happen so that when they skip into the future, they'll hopefully see a very healthy Gengai. So of course they skip and Gengai's dead again. Again. Well, somehow this keeps happening. So they're trying to skip back to the point in time that Gengai dies to see what exactly killed him and how it could be avoided. So they managed to hit that precise time where somehow Piccolo is there shooting a special beam cannon through Gengai, murdering him in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere for seemingly no reason, while Gengai is in a headlock by Madao, the resident homeless guy who was left in the city miles away. And they were just blown away that this actually happened. This is a disbelief in a Gintama reference, but it actually happened. 
The stand joke, there was no stand, but Gintoki psychology made him actually believe there was one and tried to fit how it could play out in the current universe. This actually did happen and made no sense to anyone. You have no idea how hard I was laughing when they're trying everything to save this guy from seemingly normal deaths. So they get into a position where nothing bad could possibly happen. An alien piccolo shows up and kills him. It's the funniest thing in the world. And I'm not going to spoil to you what happens after that because it's just not worth it. You should totally watch Gintama's greatness. But that is the second of the three interplot parodies. And it's amazing. The third I would like to bring up is when an outside force is trying to convince Gintoki something is real. And it winds up convincing him. And the example I would like to bring is a Kuroko no Basket reference. So in the anime Kuroko no Basket, which I personally like to call basketball with superpowers. Not that there are superpowers, but oh, I have the ultimate technique that I never miss when I shoot. It's basically a superpower, okay? And Kuroko, the main character's power is he's not physically awesome. He's not fast or strong or precise or any of that, but he mastered an art of sleight of hand that can make him invisible and unnoticeable, making his passes incredible. It's an art of misdirection that he can direct the ball in different places where the opponents never see it coming and Kuroko could sneak up on anyone flawlessly with no one noticing his presence. <laughs> Kuroko even got the title, The Shadow Sixth Man, in Kuroko no Basket because he was just a shadow, a noticeable, secretly driving the events of the story forward. Now that that was explained to kill this joke, in Gintoki's past, there were a group of guys, no need to get into spoilers who they were, what they're doing now, but the point is, they were trying to convince him that there was a Shadow Fifth Man, Kuroko, that was on his team all along that he's forgotten about. And at first he doesn't believe it, and then the evil ghost of Kuroko somehow comes out to scare the heck out of him. And once again, they bring that to the next level. They're trying to remind him of this game of kick the can where someone kicks the can far away and the next player has to get it and whatever. That they kicked the can and they forgot Kuroko there. How cruel of them. So five vengeful spirits of Kuroko are now throwing cans at each other, misdirecting them with the typical Kuroko style, scaring the living crap out of Gintoki. This is an outside force because people are trying to convince him that this parody is reality in his universe and it's kind of working, which is greatness. So that's the three types of parody that's actually interwoven into the narrative itself. When I say that, I mean the comedy arcs because Gintama's loosely split up into comedy arcs and really serious arcs. The serious arcs is some of the greatest shonen you'll see and the comedy arcs is some of the funniest shonen you'll see and references galore. Now, before getting into the third and final type of parody humor Gintama does, I would like to point out that Gintama is constantly one-upping itself with its jokes. Its humor could stop at any point, but it always goes the extra mile to make it that much better. For example, making that stand reference would have been enough without Gintoki needing to try to discover his own stand power since only his stand user could see his stand. Or when they're parodying Dragon Ball, they didn't have to go the extra mile to have Krillin die in the background, but they did because that's become a meme in the Dragon Ball franchise. And furthermore, there are dynamics in between the characters in the world of Gintama that's truly incredible. Like, not gonna lie, Gintama has one of the strongest casts I could think of offhand. And not only coming up with great characters and then discarding them when you no longer need them, but they're all used to their max potential. And that's another one of the grand five types of Gintama humor, just the inter-character relationships. Now, Gintama also merges all five of these humors together because in the, let's say, parody category, where it's Dragon Blee Peace, they're also making fun of the Gintama characters themselves in the way they would have in the actual narrative of Gintama. Shimpachi is used by the narrative itself as a practical joke character very often. So when you see Pirate King Gintoki after a year of training going Super Saiyan Pirate King Gintoki, which totally makes sense, by the way, you see Shimpachi is just a floating pair of glasses and that he's the useless support character the whole time. Like there was an entire episode focused on character development between Hijikata and Shimpachi and they ended up getting into a whole Hajime no Ippo style fight being narrated like a Yu-Gi-Oh game. I could gush over Gintama for hours on end. And now thanks to you, my captive audience, I have the ability to do so. On Rant Cafe, usually someone tries to change the subject since no one's seen Gintama, but... <laughs> 
No one's here to interrupt me now. So with that in mind, the final parody style of Gintama is meta parody. So meta humor altogether is a different one of Gintama's five categories of hilarity. In fact, that's my favorite of all five, and that will be getting its own video absolutely. It's actually the meta humor of Gintama that made me fall in love with the series altogether. But that kind of meta humor is like the famous bathroom scene where they're making fun of every other mind game anime trying to delude each other into using sandpaper as toilet paper. That's a whole different can of worms. Meta parody is not where Piccolo shows up in the Gintama world or where Gin thinks he has a stand. It's when he's referencing another anime and he knows he's referencing another anime and the meta is when something happens because of his reference. For example, Madao, our favorite homeless man, who's honestly incredible and I love him too. Gintama's so good. Decides that he knows how he's gonna make money. He's gonna start telling scary stories in the park and all the kids are gonna love him and give him dough. So he goes to odd jobs who takes any job because they're odd jobs and they're so not good at anything they accept everything. The logic's a work in progress, but the genius is there. And so Mado asks them, hey, try to tell me a scary story. So after many hilarious scary stories that aren't scary but are actually hilarious later, and of course they're all different types of parody references, the funniest is where Kagura is trying to explain how this shadowy figure is sneaking up behind the main character of the story she's crafted. And that character was some random character from Saint Seiya Omega. And he could shoot lasers and stuff. I don't know, I've never seen Saint Seiya, but that's not the point here. It obviously didn't make sense and it wasn't scary at all. It was just funny. And Madao's getting all pissed off. That's not scary. I can't use that as humor. Just because he says, I'm behind you. That doesn't make it scary. And then they turn to Gintoki and he is pissing himself in fear. He's trembling. And they're saying, Gin, why are you so scared? What part of that story was scary? It made no sense. And the terrified Gin looks up at Madao and says, Toei Animation, they're gonna copyright us. They're gonna kill us. That in itself is peak meta humor. And unfortunately, <laughs> far too relatable. But of course, Gintama's style is to always take a perfect joke and make it even better. Because as the episode ends, the scary story Madao ends up telling is that toy animation shut down Gintama. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I've only ruined like 10 jokes from the entire series, and there's hundreds of episodes of awesomeness here. But with this all said, I believe I've successfully broken down Gintama's tools at using parody as comedy. Next time on Analyzing Gintama's Comedy, I may be doing the meta humor, since that's absolutely my favorite type of humor in Gintama. And that alone without the mature storylines would put it in my top 10 anime ever. With the mature storylines, it's more like top three. But ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy. I'm sorry I went out of my comfort zone a bit here, trying something very different and very new. Not only did no one ever make a Gintama video before, not only am I terrified that I may say something wrong about Gintama, because I don't want to ruin something I love so much. And it's been a while since I've seen the early seasons. I have to rewatch it. But I've never really analyzed comedy, especially because it's kind of hard to analyze, which is why no one really does it. So let me know if you want more comedic analysis videos on, I don't know, One Punch Man or Konosuba or something. Let me know your thoughts on this video itself in the comments. I'm really curious to hear. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like. And if you want more comedy analyses, anime analyses, character analyses, feel free to subscribe. Link is in the description to my merch. Link is in the description also to my Patreon. Feel free to pledge. And link to my Twitter. Please follow me there. But back to Patreon for a second. I really wanted to thank my patrons because without them, uh, paying for editors would pretty much be an impossibility and that in turn would half my uploads. So thank you a lot. Feel free to pledge. Everyone that pledges is welcome to the Discord server where insulting me is the number one priority. So thank you, TM Philly, Teakui, Miku, Divine Reigns, Crazy Beat, Alan Weebus, Sergeant Malarkey, Nate, Mitochondria, Billy Thompson, Praise Lord Girugameshu, Digis Hendrix, Q, King Beat My Meat, Negus Nogus, Sage of Snake, Pop Up, Grumpy Welshman, Team Sparky 65, Lazy Ronan, Girthy Worm Jim, Allison Stricker, JD Fincher, Cosine Pit Shifters, E Laser, Sash, Ethan Price, King Tank Games, Frisky Dingo, Soy Boy Theories, Miriam Ramirez. Also, thanks to the Lord Twigger Rank, Measy GC, Anthony Booth, Steelers, Cream My Pancake, Prella, Rari, MD, Santo, Kiyomasa, Zindergarden, Emperor Misha, and Kyle the Warrior. Thanks to the God Usa 
Top Rank, Burning Bush, Dark Element, Necro, Sonny Parks, James Patterson, Kaiser Juanar, and Maurice Luis Dreyfus. But uh, as kind of a meme, I made a Has Hashirama Cells Rank, and Gremmin actually pledged to this top rank. So thank you, Gremmin. You absolutely have Hashirama Cells. Anyone else who wants Hashirama Cells, feel free to pledge. You'll be amazing. Link in the description. Thank you all so much for pledging, and thank you all so much for watching, even if you haven't pledged. I love y'all regardless. I've somehow developed an inability to sound sincere because it always subconsciously kicks me into the sarcastic, honest description voice, which is a disaster in real life, you should know. But with that all said and done, remember, stay weird, fam. Not too weird, because as my Discord server has proved to me, there are limits to weirdness where it gets to crazy levels. But still remember to stay weird. <laughs>